I'd like to take a minute of your time and thank you so much for tuning in to our online options at Living Streams with the podcast, the live stream, the Facebook Live. We've, we've had a really great year. The numbers have grown so much in our online situation. Overall, we've had a great 2018. We got to see a lot of cool things happen with stimulating missions and people who are getting involved. Uh, we're really thankful for how the Lord has supplied in that regard. And now 2019, we're looking forward and we, we feel like we have just as many ideas, if not more. And it's been really exciting for us as a team to, to hear from the Lord, to pray about it, and then start to set some plans for it. Also have received some gifts and provision that are going to help us. But we wanted to just take a minute and make sure you felt like you had the opportunity to participate with us as well. Some of the things we're working on is like a youth pavilion or youth center to, to meet the needs that were growing in that regard. We also want to continue to send out missionaries. We stirred the pot quite a bit last year and now we have some people willing to go for long-term missions and we're excited about that. So if you are able at all, you can pray and and uh, consider giving to us financially. Um, you can give at the app, you can give online, and, and there's other ways to give. And if you get a chance, if you haven't been to the church, we'd love for you to stop by sometimes. We can get to know you in person and, and uh, pray for you as well. God bless you and all you're doing, and I hope you have a great next year. It'll be good. All right, Origins of Innocence number nine. Um, why don't you turn in a Bible to Luke chapter one? That's where we're gonna be today. Luke chapter 1, if you want to pull out your sermon notes and a pen, you can do that. Basically, we've been focusing on that, that moment in the Garden of Eden where something changed. There was this feeling of innocence for mankind, naked and unashamed. Um, and then there was, uh, in another moment, this feeling of shame and nakedness and hiding and separation um, and fear. And it was just that moment when God came near. God would come near every day and humanity would experience the fullness of God's presence. But then one day God came near and humanity had a different response. Adam and Eve in that, in, in that, in that time when God came near and, and they had sinned, they instead of responding and with open invitation to God and experiencing His presence, they hid themselves. Um, they, they turned from God. They didn't know how to be intimate with God anymore. They didn't know how to relate with God anymore. And so that's really what we've been focusing on, and most of our messages have come out of that moment right there. And, uh, you know, it makes me think a little bit. I heard this, this analogy one time of this old farmer, and he and his, his uh, wife would, every Friday night, they'd get into his, his old farmer truck, and they'd go down the old farmer road, and they'd go to the old farmer restaurant and have a date, and and they loved each other, and they, they'd been doing this since high school um, when they were dating. And, and yet over the years, the, the old farmer would get in his truck, and at first, you know, his, his girlfriend at the time would come, and she would sit, like, almost all the way on his lap, just right up against him in the cab. And they'd drive down there, he'd put his arm around her. But, but over the years, just little by little, you know, she, she had moved a little further away, a little further. She'd get in the car, and now she'd kind of lean even against the window as they're driving on their date. And, and one day she just looks at the old farmer and says, why are you so far away from me? What's happened to us? Why are we so far apart? And the old farmer, I didn't go anywhere. I'm just still sitting here driving, but you've moved away. And that's kind of the response that the Lord would have to us. God, where are you? God, how come I can't find you? God, where'd you go? We used to be so close. And God just looks at us and said, I'm, I've never changed. My plan of innocence, my plan for intimacy with you has never changed. And that's true in the scriptures in the Garden of Eden. It's true as we look through the whole of scripture, and it's true in the end. When God does away with shame once and for all and establishes this new heaven and new earth where we are intimate, the description that we're given at that point is it's like a, a bride and a bridegroom is how God wants to be with us, intimate without shame, without fear, without separation. That's always been God's plan, and that's what we're trying to, to bring to light here because we don't feel that necessarily. We feel like something has been lost from the Garden of Eden, and it's not true. God's heart is the same for us, and that innocence can be achieved. And then we have Scripture after Scripture after Scripture teaching us that same thing. Another analogy I think of is, as we've tried to unpack this thing is if you could imagine a, a prisoner going through reintegration into society after years and years in a prison cell. 
and the different things that they go through. First, they're, they're in their, you know, cell, and then and maybe, you know, if they're bad enough, they're somehow, like, you know, constrained with chains. And so you get the chains off them. That's this first step where now they feel this freedom. And, and then you lead them out of this cell, and, and they're going out of the cell. And then you maybe lead them out of the, the fenced area where they've kind of had a little bit of freedom. And then, and then eventually they're walking out, and then they go through the gates to actually go outside the prison walls back into society, and on and on and on and go, this reintegration process. And as we know from statistics, it's very, very difficult for prisoners to reintegrate into society after what they've been through. And that's a bit what it's like for us as we've been so familiar with shame. We've been so familiar with our own guilt. We've been so, become so good at hiding, at putting up facades, at pretending that we don't have our shame or ignoring it or using substances to try and keep us from actually having to deal with it. That when God comes close to us and says, hey, let's get you reintegrated. Let's get you back into the plan and the path that I have for you. It's difficult. It's challenging. There's a lot of reworking that has to be done by the Spirit of God. But as we walk with Him, we see those things happening. I want to take a look here um, on your notes. You can see that there was some different responses to God. And we've mentioned some of these. Some of these you're familiar with, but it's going to lead us up to our response today. At first, there was the response, it was their fault. And that's Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, remember when God came close and, and God said, where are you? What happened? Who told you we're naked? What is this shame thing you're dealing with? And the man says, it was the girl's fault, which has commonly been echoed throughout all of history. <laughs> The girl made me do it. And the girl, what was her response? The devil made me do it. <coughs> Passing the buck. It was not their fault. It was, their, it was not my fault. It was their fault. Um, that's a common response when God comes close. Um, Moses, we talked about last week, his response when God came close was kind of this flippant, like, whatever, I don't know who you are. You're some little burning bush God. But I guess I'll do it if you want me to. It was kind of this flippant, whatever response. Um, then we talked about Gideon in the first message in this series. Gideon, when God came close and visited him, he said, you are a mighty man of valor. I have big plans for you. I'm going to draw out this beauty and strength from you. And Gideon looked at him and said, oh, I've seen God. Now I'm going to die. Because he was unaware of God's heart and God's plan. And yet as he began to walk with God, he got to see that come to pass. When Isaiah, it says in Isaiah chapter 6, when he, um, in the year that King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple with glory. And his response is, I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. He could just be, he was so aware of his dirtiness. He was so aware of that the words that come out of his mouth, after hearing the sound that comes out of God's mouth and seeing the beauty and holiness there, he was like, I don't even want to say a word because it sounds so dirty in comparison. And yet God took him on this process. And as Isaiah walked with him, God cleansed his lips. And he becomes someone that spoke some of the most beautiful words about Jesus Christ. Hundreds and hundreds of years before Jesus came. So much so that many people say Isaiah, Isaiah is like the fifth gospel, even though it was written way before. Um, Job, if you've ever endured the book of Job and read about Job's enduring all of this stuff, at the end of it, it says God comes in this whirlwind and he comes close to Job and his three friends that are having this debate as to why Job is suffering. And God begins to just for two chapters just say, ask them questions. Where were you when this happened? How do you know about this? Have you ever looked into the mysteries of the snow? And on and on and on, he begins to question them. And then at the end of it, Job says, I'll be quiet now. I, I don't think I need to say anything. And then, um, I don't even know what this next one is. Oh, Peter's response. Peter, when he gets to see Jesus in the flesh, Jesus is 30 years old and he's beginning his ministry, he borrows Peter's boat because Peter was a fisherman and he goes out, out to see just a little bit where he could speak to the whole crowd. And after Peter hears the words of Jesus and sees the kindness in his face and the love in his eyes, 
Peter, who's in the boat with him, says, depart from me for I'm a sinful man. He says, Jesus, you got to go away. You're, this, you're too close. I, the, the same response. But as he continues to walk with Jesus, we see another picture three years later. They're by the sea. Peter's in a boat just offshore. And Jesus, who's in his risen form now, calls to them and says, how you doing out there? And they say, we haven't caught anything. He says, cast your net on the other side like he had done before in that moment with Peter. And they throw the net over the other side. Boom, fish everywhere. Peter jumps in the boat and swims to Jesus. It's a different response in Peter at this point. And then they have this intimate conversation. And it's Peter who's driving the intimacy. Peter who's wanting to be closer and closer and know the heart of Jesus. So this, this change happens over time, but the initial response was there. And then you can think of Paul the Apostle, who Jesus came to him and said, what are you doing? Why are you persecuting me? And he led him on this journey where Paul realized he was so, so wrong. And he had a complete change of heart and direction in every way. But it took time. It took development. It took walking with God before that innocence really began to flesh out in him. And for me, I was uh, I just graduated high school. I was 17 years old, living in Oregon in a small town, Grants Pass, home of the cavemen. That was my mascot in high school. It's pretty cool. The cheerleaders had a lot of fun talking about cavemen and stuff. But... Uh, but that was it. I was there. I had plans for my life. I wanted to be an athletic trainer for the Phoenix Suns because I knew they wouldn't play, let me play. Um, and uh, I was, was kind of on that journey. And my brother had gone and taken a year off and gone to Hawaii to do a missionary school. <laughs> and I thought, Hawaii, whatever. Um, and so I was going to do that. And all my plans fell through in a moment. Everything just wasn't working out, and they couldn't accept me. And, and it was this moment of truth in my life as a 17-year-old. I, I really, for the first time, I felt like God was knocking on the door of my heart. And I had been in church many times, but there was this moment where I felt like God was coming to me, and he was knocking on my heart. And he just kind of in this whisper said, you want to do things your way, or do you want to see what I have in mind? He like just snuck in there at this moment of truth and dropped this little idea in my heart. And really it was about five months of kind of having, hitting me with that question. You want to do your way or do you want to see what I have in store? And it all kind of came together to me and I, I ended up going to the school of ministry where I was going to learn more about God and there in that school there was this guy named Jason Antley. And uh, he was a huge person. He had big hair. He had a big mouth, a big face, a big lips. He would, he would talk, and he was like, hey! It was just big voice. He had these big hands. He was a welder by trade. And he had, been, he had just these big, thick fingers, big old hands. Um, and the reason I mention all of that is because I had also heard a rumor that he was pretty good at guitar. And I just thought there was no way he was good at guitar, unless you're talking about eating them or something. <laughs> he was just, he was too big and bo like, and just, grum, grum, grum. Um, I just thought he would smash it. There's no way he could figure that. And at the same time, I was just learning how to play guitar. And uh, I was not very good, but I was practicing and I was, you know, doing my strums. And, and in the school of ministry, we all lived in the same house. And and we were in the same room, and I would, I would get out my guitar, and I'd, I'd be practicing, and just kind of doing my G, bling, 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 and I'd switch to my D, bling, bling, bling. And, and I, I was not very good, but I felt like I was getting better, and, and yet still, for some reason, whenever I'd pull out my guitar and start practicing, everyone would leave the room. <laughs> they just had stuff to do, I'm sure. Um, and, and I was practicing, but he would never leave the room. He would just sit there, um, and he'd just kind of look at me with this smile. And, and I, was just, I would just ignore him and keep playing. And, and I remember at one point he said to me, he's like, can I play your guitar? And, and I was like, no, I'm just getting my practice in. You know, I, I got to keep working on this. It's my only chance. And he knew that wasn't true. But, um, 
It was a guitar my mom had just got me because she was excited about me learning guitar and going to this school of ministry. And, um, and yeah, he just sat there patiently and asked me again and again. I don't know how many times he had to ask me before I thought he was going to hurt me if I didn't give it to him. So I finally remember like, just handing the guitar over and, I, and thinking, sorry, Mom, like, I don't know what's going to happen. I handed him the guitar. And he took the guitar and he, he just he flipped it real quick and put it on his lap and it looked like this little baby guitar um, on, on his body. And he started playing it and he started moving his fingers and, and still to that I think it's one of the most beautiful sounds I've ever heard come out of a guitar. Um, and his head, I mean his head was going and his, his afro thing wasn't even like going in the same direction as his head. And, and he, just was, it was, he was just in it, and, and all these people started coming back into the room because they were like, man, I got to know how to play. And then they were like, look at me, and looked at him, and then they were like, oh, I knew he knew it wasn't you. Um, but, and I would just kind of look at him and be like, that's my guitar right there, that's my guitar. And somehow I was getting credit for it or whatever. Um, but it, it was this thing, and it was kind of this, this moment in time, and I felt at the same time God whispering again to me through this analogy, and it's kind of been this... Every time I share my testimony, anywhere I go, it always comes back to this same story. It was like God was saying, just like Jason Antley, you want to trust me with your life? You want to keep strumming along? You want to keep doing that thing? You, it's going to be fine. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. There was nothing severe about what God was saying. It wasn't like, you better follow me or you're going to be a murderer or you're going to die tomorrow. It was nothing like that. It was just this question. I have these plans for you. I know you've heard rumors about me and what I can do with a life, but I'd, I'd like your life. I'd like to, to take your life into my hands and show you what I can do with it. And, and it was around that same time where I just finally said, okay, Lord, and I just handed everything over. I said, I want your plans. I want to see what you have, and I want to go your way. And that's really what it came down to, and, and the trajectory of my life has changed drastically. I am so far away from where I wanted to be, where I thought I would be, from what I dreamed of. And I can tell you my life is so much fuller because of it, so much richer because of it. I have no doubt at all, no hesitation in saying that whatsoever. And God wants to come close to each one of you and show you what he's been dreaming up for you and lead you on a path where he begins to, to be the one who's using your life to make beauty, to make righteousness, to make peace in the world. And sometimes it does. It feels like handing it over. And that leads us to our response today. Luke chapter 1, we get to see one more time where God came close. And we'll start in verse uh, 26. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid. Mary, you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. And his kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? The angel answered, The Holy Spirit will, over, will come on you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is now in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. And then the angel left her. So here's another moment where God comes close. Here's another moment where there is a human response to what God is saying, what God is bringing to light. 
And we have heard time and time again about how amazing Mary is in her be unto me as according to your will response. And yes, it's absolutely true. She comes to that conclusion. She comes to that thing and says, okay, I'm handing my life over. And we don't know the full understanding she had. I mean, you read that verse. I mean, it, there's no way she could have comprehended the depths and the, 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 um, the plans that God was, was declaring to her in this moment. And often it's that way when the Lord comes. I've got some plans for you. And he gives us a little bit of it in a nutshell. And we're like, what? Uh-huh. And even what we think in that moment is probably so much shallower, so much uh, plainer than really what God has fully in store for us. And that was true for Mary. She didn't get the whole concept of what God was doing. But it's, we could spend time talking about how kind God is and, and all the confirmations he gives. He gives her, the, the, her, her um, Aunt Elizabeth, her cousin Elizabeth, who's pregnant, which is kind of a miracle in itself. And so Mary actually goes and checks that out, and, and that becomes a confirmation for her. Not only that, but when she goes, uh, Elizabeth sees her coming and says, what's going on? Something inside me stirring up. The baby's leaping for joy. And, and how do I get to, to be with you in this way and get to know the plans of God in this way? And so she gets confirmation information that way and on and on and on and Joseph the scare of Joseph okay now I'm pregnant hey Joseph I'm pregnant hey good news God came and got now I'm pregnant now and the fear that must have been I mean she had this hope she had this plan betrothed to Joseph they I'm sure were making all kinds of plans and here God comes and interrupts everything and yet God speaks to Joseph, and so Joseph actually goes along with it, which is incredible. And on and on and on, so many confirma confirmations, stars in the sky, shepherds and, and, and showing up, and uh, angels showing up, and all these different things that happen to help lead Mary down this road to prove that God, what he says, will always come to pass. And it's a beautiful thing. We could also talk about all the challenges that she was going to have to face. All the dark times, the hard times that she would face. And how wonderful and amazing it was that she kept going, kept going, kept going. But what I want to draw out to us today is, is, is just her response. Is that's what we've been talking about. When God comes close, how does she respond? And the truth is, she didn't respond first with acceptance and obedience and surrender. Her first response was fear. It says here that when the angel showed up, Mary was greatly troubled. She was greatly troubled. What kind of greeting is this? She might have been extreme as Gideon. Oh, I'm going to die now. But she was thrown off for sure. And then the very next thing that she felt was confusion. <laughs> and oftentimes when the Lord comes close, we're troubled. He's rocking our boat. And we get confusion, no doubt. What are you saying, Lord? What is happening? What are we dealing with here? And those two things happened before she ultimately came to this point where there was acceptance. There was acceptance. And that's ultimately the point that God's trying to bring all of us to, this point of accepting him for who he is. And yet it's so amazing to me that he's a God who comes and knocks. The Bible says that, that Jesus comes and he knocks on the hearts of men and women. He knocks. He, ha he doesn't have to knock. He made you. He made your heart. He could come and bang down the door and do whatever he wants. In this situation, Mary basically was someone that God had chosen from before the foundations of the earth to accomplish this unbelievably massive, wonderful, universal salvation for humanity, for creation, for all who would accept him. And yet he comes gently and kindly to this young woman and he knocks. He knocks. He doesn't force he knocks. And he comes to each one of us. And I don't know how we feel so audacious that we would decide yes or no to God who made us, who fashioned us, who's given us everything. 
Yet still, the relationship that he wants with us is not one of being forced. He wants a relationship of love and intimacy. And he gently comes to us and he asks us if we will surrender. And basically, Mary, in a most profound way, actually does offer her body to the plans of God. And I don't know how long it took before she first felt whatever pregnancy feels like. I've heard it's kind of rough. But that's just because guys don't have to deal with it. Then it would be so easy. No, 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 no. No, <laughs> it would be very different probably. Guys would just, there would be like nine months maternity leave or something like that. <laughs> but, but, but she had to just kind of have this moment until actually the stuff started happening. And she had to deal with it and walk with it <coughs> and all the ramifications of it all. But in that moment, she had this time where she said to God, okay, you have come close, and I'm feeling afraid, I'm feeling ashamed, I'm feeling confused, yet I'm going to trust you in this moment of surrender. And I want to talk about what it means to accept. What it means to accept really has a lot to do with surrender and obedience. That's the thing that God is asking. That's the thing that Mary continued to have to walk in, surrender and obedience. And as God comes close to us in this Christmas message, basically what he's trying to draw us to this place where we would once again, whether you've done it a hundred times or you've never done it before, he's asking you to surrender to him, his plans, his thoughts, his will. He's knocking on your heart. He's trying to draw you close. But surrender looks like obedience for the most part. Here, Mary and Joseph, they had to go through all kinds of different things of obedience. One, she had to surrender and, and be obedient to what God was doing. One, she had to walk in this moment of just kind of waiting on Joseph and, and asking God, I'm sure, to, to speak to Joseph. But then Joseph had to become obedient to saying, okay, uh, I'm just going to trust her at her word that she's pregnant with God's baby and not, you know, John's or Robert's or whatever. And they had to walk together. And then at one point, God come to, came to them and said, you need to get out of town right away. And they did. They up and left, which I couldn't imagine the <coughs> challenge of that, going to Egypt and being there for a few years until God comes and says, all right, it's time to go back. And they had to walk in obedience and go where God was telling them to go. And that's really the response. If we want to get to a place where we're accepting what God has and we're surrendering our lives to Him, it all comes down to steps of obedience. And here's some that God might be speaking to you today. Is He asking you to be willing to quit your job or give up on that hobby? Is He asking you to give that money or join that Bible study? Is He asking you to marry that girl or break up with that guy? Is He asking you to forgive that person or say sorry to someone? Sometimes God does ask us to do the wild and crazy, miraculous stuff. But most of the time, God's just asking us to do the practical, hard, humble stuff. And that's the question that we have to ask this Christmas. What is the next step? What is God coming close to you and asking in this time? What is he speaking to you about? What is he calling you to do or not to do. Don't just do good things or right things. Do what God is asking you to do. Don't just do what God asked you to do years ago. Do what he's asking you to do today, in this season, at this time. Each time we surrender to God, shame loses power over us. It seemed the most shameful thing that Mary could do was to surrender to God in this way. Who would believe her virgin birth story? How much loss and loneliness would she have to endure by surrendering to God? What about Joseph? Yet her surrender, catch this, her surrender has led to her honor way beyond what she could ask or imagine. 
Not only did Joseph believe her story, but millions upon millions have believed her story and count her among the innocent, including us. What God begins, he will always finish. Your surrender to God will always end in honor instead of shame. The path may be hard as it was for Mary, but let her story and all the others remind us and compel us to surrender to God today and forevermore. And last night, as I was feeling the stress and pressure of preparing not only for this morning, but tomorrow night and all of that, and and we were having a little family time, and I was like, yay, family time. Can we get this over with so I can get back to work? And oh, yay, yay. And I just felt like the Lord, which he's been speaking to me so much recently, that in his economy, what happens at the church means nothing compared to what happens in my family. Absolutely nothing compared. It doesn't mean he doesn't care about this but it means nothing in comparison. When he says, what I keep laughing, what I keep enjoying, what I keep smiling on, is every time I see you interacting with those foster boys, or being with your girls, or paying attention to your wife. And so last night, I decided (laughs) I was going to uh, just resist the urge to go get to work, and uh, I walked out to where my family was and our youngest foster boy was there and he had these, he had just gotten these two little like boy dolls, I guess. They were like action figures. That's what they were. (laughs) (laughs) They were very action figures. I mean, one of them though, I I was literally like, this guy is an action figure. He's like a superhero with a costume. This was like, I really was as close to it as I think boy toys get or whatever. I was just like, whatever. And so he's like, hey, you... Sorry about this. He said, hey, you want, you want, to, you want to play with these? And I was like, no. <laughs> no way do I want to play with those. I mean, first of all, I don't even know what I would do. And second of all, I know you're going to take the action figure and I'm going to have the, the guy with the long purple hair. The action figure doll that has no weapon or shield or anything um and so I said yeah man totally and we grabbed those things and and he was the cool thing and I was the other thing and he kept throwing his shield at me and I would just not throw anything at him because I didn't have anything and and we were going, and then he, he thought, and then he got an tr- a Optimus Prime Transformer guy, and then it was the two of them against my purple doll boy. And, and he kept s- trying to smash the doll boy, and my fingers were, he was just smashing my fingers over and over and over again. And we were playing this game, and then at one point, I just kept saying, like, you know, I'm going to get you. And he started laughing, and I, we were doing this thing where the Optimus Prime head would pop up, and I would try and smash the head down, and the Optimus Prime would pop and he was laughing so, I've never heard him laugh like that. He was laughing like deep in here and having so much joy. And I was just like, man, I could have missed this. For those church people. <laughs> you know what I'm saying. And, and it's, just, it's just important to listen to what God's speaking to us. And it could be that simple. And it could be something big that he's asking you to do, and I'm not trying to minimize that. It could be something very scary, scarier than having to be a purple doll boy figure and get your hand smashed. It could be something big. But I can promise you that if you will say yes to the Lord, it will not end in shame. It will not end in shame. There will definitely be those moments where shame looks like it's going to win the day. But just like with Jesus, who went through the most immense shame for us, he did not stay in that tomb. But he rose again that now at the name of Jesus, every knee bows and every tongue confesses that he is Lord. That is the plan of God for your life. You can trust him. You can walk with him. He doesn't see you as a person of shame. You don't need to hide. When he comes to greet you, though you might feel troubled, though you might feel confused, don't run. 
but accept what he's saying and walk with him. Let's pray. Jesus, we do thank you so much that you keep coming close to crazy people like us in a crazy world that we live in these days. And Lord, I pray that none of us would miss it. It's so easy, so natural for us to respond to you with fear, with confusion, and with ignoring you or denying you. I mean, that really is a big part of our nature to do those things. That's our heritage. But Lord, we pray that you would Lord, by your spirit, we pray that you would help us to trust you, to catch what it is you're asking us to do, and that we would be right there, Lord, enduring what you ask us to do, endure, enjoying what you ask us to enjoy. And Jesus, we do thank you so much that you made a way where there was no way. That you didn't respond to our denial of you by denying us. But you loved us. And you came to us. And you made a way for us. And just with eyes closed and heads bowed in this, in this holy moment. I just want to ask again if there's anyone in this room who, who doesn't think they're in a relationship with God, who's never really surrendered to God or said yes to Jesus, and you can feel him knocking on your heart right now. Or maybe it's been five months like it, like it was with me where God was knocking and knocking and knocking. If you're ready to say yes today, if you're ready to surrender and begin seeing what he has in store for you, this is your moment. You can go ahead and slip your hand up as just an acknowledgement to the Lord that you're ready. Awesome. Just hold it up for a second so I don't miss it. Anyone else? I know it seems simple or maybe even silly, but it can make a big difference in your life. That's good. Okay, you can put your hands down. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for these that are, that are trying to respond to you. And we pray that your spirit would come and you'd send people around them to come and help them know how to unpack this, Lord what you're doing deep inside their souls. And I pray, Lord, that they would know today that if they say yes to you, you say yes to them. And you write their name in your book of life. Oh, we do thank you that salvation can now come because of Jesus. We pray all this in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, we're going to all rise as we sing one last song. And we'll have our prayer team up front. If you'd like to come and get some prayer for anything, that would be great. And if you did raise your hand, I would ask that you would come forward too and, and just talk with one of the people up here and get some prayer as well. I know it's a scary step, but it'd be a good thing for you to do as a first step. So come on forward.